Mozambique, one of the poorest countries in the world when it achieved independence, is now emerging as a land of opportunity. Yeah, come on. Isto é República do Panza 2002-2003. Yeah, you're standing one foot on earth, one, one foot in the sea. That makes a big difference. República do Panza. Its coastline, climate and key trading routes have lured travellers in for centuries, but today it's becoming the epicentre of a mining and energy boom, and everyone's piling in for a share of the spoils. Well, where does this leave Mozambicans, many of whom live under the poverty line and have yet to taste the real benefits of this new prosperity? Is history in danger of repeating itself? Well, the true test may well come in the shape of Mozambique's other boom sector. Tourism. I would love to teach uh, more Mozambican and more women how to dive and show them how wonderful the underwater world is. So on this journey, I'll be finding out if it's tourism that can truly empower ordinary Mozambicans by meeting the artists who've been turning the scars of civil war into a healing contemporary culture, discovering how wildlife's being nurtured back into nature reserves and learning how Mozambique's first qualified diving instructors are struggling to find work in their own country. The three o'clock train service to Mozambique's capital, Maputo, is due. This is going to be fun. Have you seen this train? And street traders and families wait to return to the big city. Something tells me this is going to get very cosy. In the early part of the 20th century, railway lines like this were corridors of trade, connecting, for instance, the gold mines in South Africa to the East Coast and then onto the rest of the world, which made Mozambique really important. Today, in terms of passengers at least, there are only really two functioning train lines. But Mozambique is interested in carrying a lot more people around the country as tourists. This station, regarded as an architectural masterpiece, was designed at the height of the Portuguese colonial rule. In fact, even today, Maputo is described as an Afro-Mediterranean city. The Forte Lazada, fashioned from red stone in classic Portuguese style in the 18th and 19th centuries. Mozambique's history is a tapestry of colonial invasions. The English, the French and the Dutch all had a go, but it was the Portuguese that clung on until the mid-1970s. In the 1930s, the Portuguese government began to draw even more heavily on its colony's raw materials and labour. But that approach only ignited resentment and the resistance movement. 500 years of colonialism and 20 years of civil war have left a big mess to clean up. But the healing process is well underway. So that, so that. 
Hundreds of thousands of guns have been seized since the end of the war and decommissioned in a unique way by the country's artists. <laughs> Back in 1997, Gonzalez was learning his craft as a sculptor, but guns were a familiar sight. His uncle had been a freedom fighter. This, because this is the weapon was real, it was burning, you know, you can see. It's buried. You never know if they have a bullet inside or not. Today, Gonzalez's work is exhibited around the world, sending a very different message. He was asked by Bill Clinton to visit the White House and to create an award for the former US president's Global Initiative Project. Yeah, he's my friend. He's a good guy. But in peacetime today, some 20 years after the war ended, what purpose is Gonzalez's work serving? Is there still a worry about violence today? Is this still relevant today in the same way, do you think, as before? The relevant, the weapons. Yeah, and relevance to the weapons turning into art. I think the, the, the weapons are still relevant. In, For in Gonzalez, if poverty and inequality persist, then there is always the danger that out of desperation, some people will resort to violence. And tourism, he believes, can only be a force for good if ordinary Mozambicans have a stake in it too. It's bad when some people they have a little bit of money and they come and they do okay, do, do what else, and they use our people and they not give good salary and they work like slaves. Mm -hmm. That's not good. Gonzalez himself is preparing a new exhibition which he's taking to Europe very soon. Hmm, I wonder if he needs any artistic inspiration. I was thinking more like, can I try a little bit of welding or anything like that? Ah, you can try, yeah. yeah. Why not? Yeah. yeah. Put it down. Yeah. But you must touch it slowly, not slowly. Slowly. the force. Okay. You understand? You can take it out. Yeah, that's good, that's good. And pull it out. Wow, look at that. Now that, I think... Yeah, you're quite more than my work. <laughs> has has that will now be a masterpiece. And when you sell this for thousands of dollars... I have to give you You something. have to give me half. Is that OK? Oh, no, half, no, 10%. 10% deal. Oh, OK. <laughs> wow, I'm an artist. Gonzalez may have his reservations, but for many with a stake in Mozambique's gas and minerals boom, the future does look bright. So does the country actually need tourism? Gas, oil, trees, wood, even the coal are all exhaustible resources. Those resources will finish one day. They can last for 100, 200 years, but they will finish one day. However, the tourism activity in a country like ours has huge potential and can never end. So, even more incentive for another scramble for Africa. Everyone's eyeing the prize, from the Americans and South Africans to the Chinese rapidly building new infrastructure. And the Portuguese are back too. Prospects here look far better than at home right now. In the old days, young Portuguese people may well have turned up here in search of a cheap beach holiday. Today, they're more likely to turn up in search of work, any work. It's Saturday morning and Maputo's fish market displays its usual dazzling array of seafood. Some of these you cannot find anywhere else in the world, and that's thanks to Mozambique's uniquely warm waters. When you look at a fish, for instance this fish, what do you look for? I know you would normally have it cold delivered to you, but when you look at the fish, what are you looking for to see if it is a good fish? Uh, in the eyes. In the eyes, yeah. yeah the eyes, yeah. Uh-huh. And the, the, the inside. Yeah. The color. Uh-huh. It's, it's good. And the... The stomach. Or the stomach, yeah. 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 Oh, 
Marco Silva may have been an interior designer by training in his native Portugal, but he also knows all about fine cuisine. A year ago, he spotted a gap in the market and came to Maputo to open an upmarket fish restaurant. After only three months, it regularly fills up to its 160-person capacity, especially at weekends. With these new discoveries happening in Mozambique and with the influx of foreigners here, people will start to expect more. They will want to eat in better restaurants and try different types of food. It will help tourism. Marcos's partner and manager are both Portuguese, and the rest of the staff Mozambican. So is this history repeating itself with Mozambicans at the bottom of the pile again? Mozambique is a land of opportunity. It should be seen as an advantage, not as a conquest. At the end of the day, it's a niche waiting to be developed. It is a leap of faith we are taking. There are Mozambicans who think the same thing and are also opening restaurants and developing various businesses. New cuisine and new restaurants may still be a fledgling business in Maputo, but tradition still has a big role to play in entertaining foreign visitors. The big weekend ritual is to hit the beach with street food, partying and music, the order of the day. This traditional instrument, the timbila, still plays a key role in the festivities. As many as 25 can perform together in an orchestra. But nowadays, world-renowned exponents are also fusing it with contemporary music. We never played timbilas like that. This is out of tune. Discord, it's like yeah. a discord, yeah? Discord, yeah. So it's always with one. Right. You see? And you can also play like... Okay, I'm itching to have a go. My turn. Now four, four. This can be something. The timbila today has become a symbol of continuity and renewal. With um, the civil war, has been killed so many timbilas play, you know. And when the Civil War was finished, everyone in Mozambique, he find out that we will never go back to the past. Coming up, after decades of being poached for ivory, are elephants in Mozambique safe? After all they say, elephants never forget. There it is, a young elephant. My journey around Mozambique continues, now with a broader perspective. Once you head out of Mozambique's capital, Maputo, you quickly realise how much this country is still dependent on its land, its agriculture, its mineral resources and its national parks. And that, in a sense, is what tourists really want to come and see.
Down on the ground, a rough dirt track takes you on a bumpy ride into the Maputo Special Reserve, one of four big national parks in Mozambique. <laughs> If Mozambique wants wildlife holidaying to be part of its tourism portfolio, then it needs, well, wildlife. And for many decades recently, animals here were under immense threat. Rudolfo Cumbane is in charge of monitoring and replenishing endangered wildlife species. Many the casualties of a brutal past, like the African elephant, which up until now has been denied the freedom to follow ancient migratory paths. South Africa was one country with its own politics. It had apartheid in between. Mozambique was a different country. And uh, let's say the states were not speaking the same language. They were not friends. So borders had to be there and firmly established. But today they are, with borders abolished for the elephant's natural pathways, and many elephant families reunited by relocation back to Mozambique. Now we're giving back to nature what has always been there. Now understand that nature has to be there because it's part of our development. At the moment, you're only getting about 5,000 tourists a year. But once the animal numbers pick up, what are you hoping that the tourist figures will be in the future? The growth of tourism numbers may not necessarily be equivalent to the growth in the tourism attractions, but definitely if we're talking of 5,000 today, we can very easily talk of around 15 to 20,000 within 5 to 10 years. You enjoy your job? Love it. <laughs> Where you can see an elephant from one end, yep. and on some spot you just turn to the east, and then you see a whale shark. I think wow. we are really sort of privileged to be here. Yeah. Today, the elephant population at the Maputo Special Reserve has returned to its 1977 level of 350. There's clear potential for more growth, and judging from my experience, the younger members of the herd are venturing out and flourishing in this new environment. So to my final stop, wildlife that's in abundance and indeed a major draw for Mozambique, 500 kilometres north up the coast in the coral reef. In Hambani today is one of Mozambique's most important tourist hubs. Its history is pretty relevant to the fate of the whole continent too. It's mid-morning and the catch is in, but fishing wasn't in Hambani's only almost lucrative trade. Originally a bustling port for ivory and then textiles, it then became the focus for the most pernicious export sector, slavery. In total, a million Africans were shipped out of Mozambique's ports in the 19th century. Just 20 minutes' drive from Inhambane are the pristine sandy beaches of Tofo. Marine life is set to play an increasingly pivotal role in Mozambique's future. The coral reef is what attracts many tourists, while overfishing of rare species and illegal poaching of whale sharks, for instance, is causing tension between environmentalists and local communities. This is Mozambique's first homegrown diving instructor. Now also a passionate campaigner for a charity called the Bitonga Divers. Their goal? To get his compatriots to get involved in tourism. And Kudzi is Mozambique's first qualified female diving instructor and inevitably a role model. 
When I first came here to Tofu, I used it to work as a waitress. And then, uh, my workplace, it, it was located right on the beach. So every day I used to see these people going out on the boat uh, and wearing their skin suits. That's they how I used to Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, wow, how, that's awesome. I'd like to do that. It took a year to pass the dive master course, during which time Kudzi worked unpaid from 7 a.m. to 6 in the evening at the diving equipment shop. Although she did get funding to pay for the training. They didn't believe I would really be able to dive, but because I really wanted to do it, I insisted and I asked it, I asked it, and then they, they let me, they told me, we let you try and then we see how it goes. But even having qualified, Kudzi has only won half the battle. She struggled to get hired and has had to procure equipment by whatever means. You're the first female yes. Mozambique yes. instructor yes, and am. it's still difficult to it, get work. It's very, very difficult to get work. Why? A lot of the dive shops here, they prefer to, to uh, hire the people from outside, outside of Mozambique. So like South, South Africans. Africans and foreigners instead of Mozambicans. It's very, very sad for us because we really struggle to get jobs. The Pitonga divers are on a mission to also teach the value of conservation and tourism and not the destruction of endangered marine species. There is, though, considerable evidence of shark and manta ray hunting. Shark fins, for example, are worth $60 a kilo as a delicacy for soup in China. But in local communities where fishing has been a tradition for generations, persuading people to change is no easy task. It's a process that will take a long time, that we have been it's a process that will take a lot of time. We have been working with local communities, showing them that the resources they have are also their wealth, and that their future depends on those resources. That's also the future of the next generation. The man who founded Bitonga Divers himself worked in hotels and bars for three years. So does he believe there are opportunities for Mozambicans to get ahead in tourism? It's one of the issues, but that it takes time to change. You know, you, you can, it's very difficult to teach Mozambican to run a big hotel now when there's none. You know, it has to be uh, hotels run by experienced people from outside, I believe that. During some time, they will learn. The government hopes that by 2020, Mozambique will have four million visitors. 30 years ago, during the Civil War, that figure was just 1,000. So a country with a ravaged past blinks nervously to a bright future, and one of the world's best coastlines stops becoming one of the world's best kept secrets. The real hope is that these easygoing people get a fair share of the benefits. They sure as well deserve it. Otherwise, as the famous Civil War mantra goes, a luta continua. The struggle goes on.